Fred and Sidney just got back from here in the Willie Hen down at uh, Bella Vista. And I'm going to do an experiment that he showed us. And I want you to listen close to me. And I want you to answer me back with some kind of response. Uh, God will heal you. Amen. Uh, God will deliver you. Amen. Uh, God will set you free. Amen. Okay, here's the, here's the test. He said the subliminal message is, when I said God will heal you, the subliminal message is what's said. And when you said amen, it gave you power to sickness. I take it back. <laughs> When I say God will bless you, that the subliminal message, I'm not blessed. And we said amen, and give power to, to not to the poverty. There's a lot of uh, subliminal things that goes on, and we, we think we're saying the right thing. And I'm not trying to make things complicated, but as a whole, Christians don't think. Any place you work, they send you to school to to, to know better how to do your job. And, uh, and David's got 20 years of, of experience with Walmart alone, not counting all the other years of trucking. But they, they send us to defensive driving school every six months. Every, every six months, defensive driving, defensive driving court. What do you But for 20 years, he's been going to that. And it's mandatory. But he had to have 300,000 miles before he could even fill out an application at Walmart. So they want you to be on top of you know, the latest thing, the latest rules, the latest regulation. Uh, in Christianity, it seems like, and I'll blame this on the preacher, they want you not to know much. You know why? So they keep it in their thumb. If we can scare you enough, if we can keep you so afraid, then we can control you. As preachers, we can control you. And so, <clears throat> my message is not that. I don't want to. I don't want to scare you. I want to give you hope. Willie was saying uh, another thing that really touched my heart was and how I missed it in my life. The Bible says, "Train up your child in the way he should go." And he said, what we do, we train them up and tell them how they should not do it. Oh, I'm so guilty of that. Don't do this, don't do that. If we just tell them what to do. You know? And I thought how much in ministry, how much we teach, don't do this and don't do that, when we should tell them what to do. John says the don't will take care of themselves and we know what to do. So, we're going to talk today about uh, the God-man, part two. And uh, in Revelation chapter one, uh, the more I, I meditate on this and think on it, the more I see how this really is the revelation of the God-man in the earth. Now, how many, even the world who don't go to church, know something is coming, we're coming close to something. Right? And uh, the preachers out there saying the world's coming to an end. Now, I didn't know that was prophesied in 1913. I didn't know it was prophesied in 1939. I didn't know it was prophesied in 1950. I, I bought a book yesterday called All the Prophecies About uh, the World Coming to an End. It's come right on down up to 1970, 1988, Y2K. You know, everybody knows something is about here. What we're coming to is an end of an age. I will tell you, the, the world has had a lot of those end of the ages in history. There's an industrial age. That and those ages have a lap time. They lap over one another. Don't start today and in 20 years from now. It has some lap time. With everything that God does, there's always a lapping effect. For instance, and I said this before, when did today start? Huh? 
1201. Most of you were sleeping and it should have been. Right. <laughs> we call it night, but it was really the beginning of today. Oh, I've got to insert this. Really, we were sharing the other night how that we are light. And you can get night vision cameras and it will find you. Because we're light. He said, I don't care how dark the room gets. You stay in there long enough, your eyes will adjust, you can see. Because we're light. It's just automatic. It just works. So, if we can uh, understand that, that you're so much more powerful and so much more of God than you even realize. Because you look at your failures, you look at your downfalls, you look at your mistakes. And you amplify them in your own mind, and you feel like I'm this little old nothing, right? When you feel when you feel bad, you don't do the right thing, and all of that. We lower our estimation of ourselves. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be paid on the thing. Get up and go on. Amen. Revelation chapter one says this is a revelation of who? All right. Stop right there. Jesus came. Roughly 2,011 years ago. David unloaded. Was that Marshall, Missouri, somewhere over there? He said the guy had a star on his arm, a million star, something. And David just commented, what, what was that? He said, oh, I'm an atheist. David said, he kind of caught me off guard. He said, what would you, he called me, he said, what would you say to him? I said, well, offhand, it probably caught me off guard too, but I would have said this. What you write on your checks? <laughs> you write the date on your checks? Every time you write 2011, or whatever year, you're saying that was 2011 years after Christ. Uh -huh. I think you got them. <laughs> <coughs> There's a lot of different things to say. But I'm just saying, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But what happened? Jesus was really God. Yes. God decided that in, in, in his mind to, to, to uh, since he was ruler of all, since he spoke the, the world and, and the, or, and the uh, universe and put it in his place and everything in his orbits and his working, all, doing all it's supposed to do, he wanted to make man. Of somebody he can fellowship with. Yes. And out of our limitations, he put up with our limitations, he put up with our shortcomings, and put up with our sin to be able to fellowship with in some small way. But man could never achieve right standing with God until. Because the blood of bulls and goats could never take it away. It could just cover. So Jesus, so God came and tabernacled in a man called Jesus, and he, he gave interest in this work, not illegally, but he came just like you and I would come to a woman. But Jesus was the visible expression of an invisible God. Now, I thought, I thought for many years, when I shut my eyes and pray, I'd see God up in heaven and Jesus on his right hand. I wouldn't have missed a lot of time with him. I wouldn't have heard to see it. Sometimes you can say things and say things and say things and say things and the 15th time we get it. And we say there's three in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But we never could put a face on the Holy Ghost, right? But we call ourselves Trinity. There's only one. Only one. God tabernacled in this man Jesus so that human humanity could touch him. Up until then, humanity couldn't touch him. But once he tabernacled this man Jesus, people could touch him. He could touch them. So Jesus was the 
man's side of God. Christ was the God side. It's not Jesus Christ. It's not Jesus like his last name. Well, they said, I mean, they said some of them were using the curse part. He said, oh. he said, look at that. You get so mad at us. It's like, Jesus Christ, get out of here. <laughs> he said, that using that form, it's almost like a curse word. It's not that either. Jesus was the man. Christ was the God son. <coughs> so now we get to Revelation and we see people are still thinking and teaching it's the end of the world. And all kinds of things, and the, as I mentioned earlier, the bugs are going to start coming out of the ocean, biggest boat flights, and all kinds of things are going to happen. And uh, they're scared spitless. They don't know what, what's going to happen. Is California all going to just slide off of the ocean? Uh, you know, all kinds of things are just, they're uh, groping for answers. But I'm telling you, when we get to the book of Revelation, Jesus tells John what the Revelation is. And he first starts off teaching about the character of of this Jesus Christ. Now in the end of the age, it's not Jesus from Bethlehem that's going to come back to the earth because if he was going to come back to the earth, there would be no need for the book of Revelation. Is that the consensus here? Why would we need that? Why is it important? <coughs> Why is it important all through the book of Revelation with all these different stories taken from previous scripture why is it important that we know all of that? Because it's a revelation of the body of Christ. That's you. That's you. It's the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. He already manifested. He already showed us what he would do and did do. When we get here to the book of Revelation, it says that the revelation of Jesus Christ, not revelations plural, but one revelation, many stories. We started off in verse 4 and found out there are seven spirits before his throne. We've got to understand if this talking about people in the earth, we've got to understand where his throne is. I pray, even after I was a minister for many, many years, I thought his throne was in heaven. And I thought heaven was like a Chicago in the sky. Had a river down through the middle. I don't need to get there by myself. You all being the same way. <laughs> matter of fact, we find in Genesis chapter 1, heaven started here. It's between the waters and the sky. That's clouds. It's got water in them. And the waters on the earth. He said in the middle of this, he called it what? Firmament. In the next sentence, it says, and the firmament he called heaven. And as Adam, what we call, we use the terminology, fell. As Adam fell in the garden, he disobeyed in the garden. Heaven got farther away in our mind. Till we get to our generation, heaven is so far up there beyond outer space, we can never reach it. So we create a rapture that somehow or another, in spite of all our meanness and all that, we're going to go sailing up I mean, so much stuff that, we, that we've taught in the past is like Cinderella. It's, it's, it, it's a, an Easter Bunny and all that kind of stuff. It's fairy tales. You know, if you look all through the Bible, everything the children of God ever did, He brought them through it. There wasn't an escape route. He brought them through it. And in order to come through what's happening in these last days, we're going to have to have the character of God so rich in us that we don't have to say a cotton picking word. They can see it and feel it. Just being around us. So the first thing that, that Jesus tells John is there are seven spirits around this throne. And we find out if God is tabernacle in us, just like he tabernacle in Jesus, 
God would be tabernacle on his throne, right? right? So his habitat is in us. So if God's habitat, the place he lives, is in us, then that's where his throne would be. You know, and, and, and don't, don't, uh, I don't want to sound so ridiculous, but I want you to see this in, in reality. Uh, if the throne is way up there in the sky someplace, it seems too unattainable. Right? But when we understand God is tabernacle here, the throne is here, it'll change your prayer. It'll pray, change your style of praying. Because as long as he's way up there, our prayers are so melancholy and so need-based, and I'm just this little old me, and you're this great big you, and how could you be concerned about my little problem? It's my little problem is a big problem to me. <coughs> my problem is maybe not a big problem to Lisa, but Elisa's problem might seem small to me, but it's big to her. So all of our problems is humongous to us. Amen? Amen. I want to say this on the other side. Uh, Brent's going in the hospital too. So let's just stretch your hands towards him right now. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for my case. Father, I just thank you. <coughs> that every molecule in his body will function as he's created to. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, whatever the doctors can do, it will be in harmony with you. The surgery will be in harmony with you. No matter what they surgically remove or change, it takes you to heal. So we're thanking you, Lord Jesus, that this Tuesday, that there be miracle working power working in, in Brent's body. Hallelujah. Through the surgery, out of the surgery, after the surgery, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're working in that whole scenario in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Matter of fact, he, God's already done his part. Yes. We've got to get our, even our terminology changed. We're not going to be, will be, he's working it now. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for changing it. So we've got these seven spirits before the throne. What, do you remember what some of those seven spirits were? What is one of them? Fear of the Lord. We're, we're in this generation has no fear of the Lord. I'll do what feels good. I don't care whether anybody likes it or not. I'll just do what feels good. There's no fear of the Lord. And I'm not talking about being scared. Like some spooks going to jump out at you at night. I'm talking about that. I'm talking about a, a fear that may, that's, that's a reverence. I, honor, I want to do this real bad. I think my flesh would love it for 10 minutes. But the condemnation afterwards is worth it. And I will reverence the Lord and follow follow God. That's another one. The spirit of wisdom. Well, so many times people are not interested in the things of the spirit so much they wouldn't know wisdom if they met it in the street. So we've got to grow in these things. The spirit of knowledge, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might. I mean, Christians about the dozen have, the bigger churches have counselings ministers that just do counseling. You got Christians that takes uppers and downers just to get to sleep and just to get going and start it. We're so when I say we, I just got to talk about present company accepted, but uh, in general. We're so uh, pharmaceutical uh, dependent. You know, these things that the, the spirit that Jesus says to John that the God man in the earth is going to function. There's got to be some changes here. Uh, he said, uh, we'd be a candlestick. And inside this candlestick was what? One like the Son of God. As, as, as we ought to be, uh, how many of you drove down the road and saw a great big fire? Yeah. Off to left or right. And you wasn't in such a big hurry, but what, you couldn't do what? Go drive by. Well, we ought to be so in fire for the Lord. If nothing else, people just come to watch us burn. That's right. 
Amen. So we we found out that uh, uh, he, this God better be clothed with a garment of praise from his head to his foot, and he'd be girt around his breast with a golden girdle, right? And uh, his head and his hairs were white like wool. That means our thinking is so pure. We've got to understand this in the light of spirit. If we still think hair and head, we're still down in this, uh, as Willie said, there's three types of life. There's this biological life, there's solical life, and there's zoe life. That's higher than the other, the other two lifestyles. We need to think zoe life. That's the life of God. Think in, in God's uh, Paul said, but we have the mind of Christ. Most of, I read that and I said, I've said it right to myself. I know. Because I still think carnal. There's a time in our growing experience that we need to think like God thinks. If somebody messes up, we see the mess up. God sees the potential. Okay. Amen. I'll never forget hearing Judge the Cornwall say many, 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 many years ago. I think he passed away a couple of years ago. I uh, listened to a tape and he says, uh, you know, and, and it, he said it about his day, but he's all over me. But my day, growing up as a teenager, the big thing in church was drinking and smoking. Boy, a guy comes to the altar if they get them camels out of his pocket or Paul Walls or whatever they were. <laughs> Do they still make them? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> they could get him out, that was out of his pocket, and throw him all on, or he could get saved. They was more interested in that than loving the guy. And he says, here's a guy. He's, he gets saved, and he, uh, he has a, a desire to get drunk. <coughs> and he says, he just overcome. And that night he has another desire to get drunk and he overcome. The next day or two, something comes up and he gets him all frustrated and he just his old pattern was go to the tavern and get drunk. But he don't do that. He just hangs in there. He goes on and on and on, has all these opportunities. Go get drunk. But don't do it. After 1,969 times of temptation, he he decided to get drunk. And the church says, See, I told you. God said, No, that's my man. Amen. You don't see the 1,699 times he overcame. That's a good man. See, we need to think like God. Think like God. And uh, this, this whole chapter is just showing us how the, the God man in the earth that God is preparing in this end of the age that's not going to act like the rest of the folks. So he speaks like fine brass. Fine was white with brilliance. Uh, as if burning the furnace. His voice was sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. The God man has in his right hand. I called into this week and I said, this word right is sticking in my thought process. Go to concordance and find out if Right has has much something to say here, or he just say in his hand. But the scriptures are pronounced to say his right hand. To see what the what right has to do. Why do you say his left hand? And the, the concordance says the uh, right is the hand which takes. And in this case, it's a feminine word, just as a man and a woman. Is to give the woman faith. He says, This God man has in his right hand seven stars. Now we can look down later in chapter 2 what the seven stars are. It's the angel of the seven churches, the messenger of the seven churches. He has in his right hand. So he's, he, he takes, he receives from those who are messengers. He don't have all the answers himself. He, he receives. Alright? I remember in 1 Timothy 2.8, he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. 
And it says, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Without wrath and doubting. How many times have we went to the worship service, we lifted our hands, but they were there was wrath and doubting back here somewhere in our mindsets. We doubted some brother or doubted some sister or whatever, and we was bad. But we felt a little better because we, we joined in with everybody. The other place talks about if, when you bring your offerings, if you got all of against one somebody, I don't know who's checked this in, I'll help look at it. But if you got a problem with somebody, bring your offering, it says the scripture. But go and make it right. If you don't, all you're going to get is a tax deduction. Some people only give for the deduction, and that's all you're going to get. We never got a tax deduction. Let and I made it for a hundredfold return. We give outside of this church. And we don't turn it into nobody. You know? I just want I just want God's teaching us to be generous. I'm generous here first. This is my first place. If I got stuff left over, I give outside of it. And that's to help people, and so we'll give to some ministry, so what? Is that a right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth with a what? A, a sharp two-edged sword. Turn to Psalms 149. I just want to show you these things are talking about the God of in the earth today, not the Jesus that was born in Bethlehem. In Psalm 149, verse 6, so let the high praise of God be in their mouth and a what? Two edged sword in their hand. To what, what's it do? To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments of all the people. To bind their kings with what? Chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. This is what words do spoken in humility. It goes on to say, To execute upon them the judgment written, This honor has, has all the saints in heaven. It don't say that, does it? What's it say? All the saints. This honor has all the saints, so what are we going to do? Praise the Lord. There's something about speaking a word in season. There's something about speaking life. Whether you know it or not. Sometimes, Brent, we don't always know what we're saying. We know what we're saying, but we don't know how it affects them. Have you ever talked to somebody and just in their sharing with you and their, their small talk with you and put together something in here that you've been thinking about? Share lady, do you know it? That's how the spirit works. So as we, we meet people and we share with people, be so quick to be be non-condemning. The Bible says after John 3, 16, it says, He came not to condemn the world. Was that right? He didn't come to condemn it. He came to change it. To save it from what they in. Amen. To, to see that they had a change of mind, a, a soundness of mind, a, a preservation and all that. Look at Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4 verse 12. For well, the word of God is what? Quick. That means uh, alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of what? The thoughts and the intent of the heart. It's the word that's the, the two-edged sword. You know, I grew up in a, in a time frame when preachers would, after church, said, ah, I really got them. I cut them to, to the blood. And I poured salt in the wound. And I, you know, as a little boy, I grew up here, and I'll, I'll say this, my dad never did say that. I never heard that from my dad. And I don't think my dad would agree with that. But I heard people say that. And after I left home and traveled for the tip, I would hear people say things like that. I didn't know how to combat it. 
but it hurt me. I didn't know how to combat that. It just seemed like that wasn't the spirit of Christ. It just, it just didn't seem like it fit in me, and I just thought, why am I feeling so opposite of everybody? That seems like it's not humility. That's not the spirit of Christ. But you know what? Our word should be so tender that it just goes to the joints and the marrows, the very inside of the people, and it deserves a thought. I'm not saying you deserve it necessarily, but the words you said deserve their thoughts, the things that they were worried about and thinking about and upset with, or maybe even thought things they were thinking about doing, and as you shared with them, it discerned that. It just went right in there. Here's that and cut it off. Man, that sounds good. Amen. Ain't that a lot better than some preacher sticking his bony finger on your nose? Oh, yes. Let me go on. Think it off. Isaiah 57 says withdraw it. There's three pointing back at you anyway. So. Amen. Let's go back to Revelation. Chapter 1. It says, uh, and his countenance was as the sun that shineth in his strength. Have you have you ever seen anybody that their countenance was always uh, depressed? You know, I frown so long, it's 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 hard. I, and I know about this stuff. I could be one Sunday. And David says, smile. You know, I, you know, of course, I'm concerned God spoke to me. It's not. I, I thought I wanted more. You know, I tell women all the time, I say, I'm just, I'm just dreaming with them. You know, these people just go around and just can smile. They're not even saying that. And when they talk, they smile. I want to do that. Because I've grew up with so many don'ts in my life that it's put a frown on my face. And I don't even want it. And it still has lapped over all these years. I want to be so full of smiles that it's contagious. And the only way I know to get those smiles is to laugh and tell funny things and that kind of thing. But uh, Linda has a once in a while said, smile, buddy. I was in a truck stop. I've told you this story before, but somebody didn't hear it. The truck stop in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Four o'clock in the morning, there wasn't a soul in there but me in that restaurant. A couple come in, and uh, they sit about two tables over from me. This gal looked over at me. She said, if you don't smile, I'm going to throw a salt shaker at you. <laughs> Never seen them before. And I thought, here I am, loving the Lord. Got a good job. I didn't know I was found. I said, as far as I was concerned, God spoke to me. You know, God used a jackass to speak to the prophet. He used a rooster to speak to Peter. And I don't think she was even one of those, but <laughs> she didn't have the appearance of a Christian. <laughs> but God used her to speak to me. And I thought, man, that must have had a horrible frown for her to say, you know what's mine? I'm going to throw a salt at you. You know? Man, we let the, the problems of this world came in on us. Amen. We get to a worship service, and it's hard to even move a foot. And I'm speaking to myself. And, and I told Linda, I said, man, I'd be willing to go take some dancing lessons. That's how much I want to. And I've been up there and he'd say, he'd say, oh my God, I'd love to do with that. I said, I would too. And I, I come back with this, I got two left feet. I don't have two left feet, though. But it's like saying I'm not going to. You know, somehow or another, somehow or another, we, we've got to break loose. I remember a guy come to, come to Calvary Temple, and I was pastoring down there, and David and Senator might remember this guy. He found a global haze. And, uh, he said, it does, he said, how many can just clap your hands when it serves? Well, we can all clap our hands. He said, what, you know what that says? He said, just get up here and all line up. He said, he said, just get on one foot. 
He stood there like this. I felt like a dog in a fire. And it, it looked awful to me. And we all stood there on one foot. He said, now hop. We hop. He said, now get on the other foot. Hop. He just did that twice. You know, he pulled a little bit of expression out of us. A little bit of expression out of us, more than just clapping our hands. But many times we're even afraid to do that. We started turning the lights out here on purpose so the light won't intimidate you. Just so you'll be a little more expressing than just sitting there looking. You know, at least see. Do something that you don't do in your front room, at home. You know, and maybe you'll start doing this at home. I remember Larry wanted your sister and brother-in-law went to our church for a while and moved away, and they'd come over to our house at, at night. Remember, uh, uh, what's the name? Jim and Joyce. They had two boys or three boys. Two at the time. They had another way. They'd come over. We'd go down in our basement. I don't know why we did that. Why we couldn't go to the living room. But we'd put on a music tape and we'd all dance. Those two little boys would dance with all their might. And they'd worship God and sing in tongues. And, and, and both of those boys were missionaries today. They just danced before the Lord so loose and Oh, I just, I, I just so jealous of them. How they can just dance for, for a, you know, I don't know how long they could set tape in there. You know, probably 80, 90 minutes, or 60 minutes, I guess it was. And we dance, that one side, turn it over, just go back to dance and praise the Lord. That was a highlight in my life. You still, you still, you remember that, don't you, Sherry? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, some, there's got to be some kind of expression that's, that allows us to, to get out of our shell and break that. We're the God man in the earth in this end of the age time. His countenance was as the sun that shineth in his strength. Verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell <coughs> at his feet as dead. That's what John's saying about Jesus. When I saw him, I fell as, as dead at his feet. And I began to think about it. I thought, that it's high time we become so full of the all-encompassing love of God that as we speak that the world not necessarily will physically fall at our feet but they will fall at our walk in God fall from where they're at because our loves took away their defenses this is a an allegory of what God is doing in a people the head has already come the head Jesus, he's already, he already came and was manifested in, before 2011. So now in the end of the age, God's going to manifest himself in a people because the people are his body. So th these are, are an allegory of what he's doing with us. And as and he laid his, there's that right hand again, upon me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. How long have we been with God? What is it? All right, let's prove that. Proverbs chapter 8. We're about that. Proverbs 8. Now, verse 1 talks about wisdom. Does not. Does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of the high places, by the way, the places of the past. She crieth at the gates and the entrance of the city and coming in at the doors. Wisdom is what's dancing around the throne of God inside of you. Uh, some people, I preached this at one place and the preacher got a little mad at me because he said, no, this is Jesus. Which the New Testament said he met Jesus has been made unto us wisdom. Mm -hmm. And there are three other things. Wisdom and sanctification and justification and something else. But anyway, look at verse 22. It said, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. 
I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or at ever the earth was. When there was no depth, I was brought forth. And when there is no fountains abounding of water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills were brought forth, while as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, what's the next three verses? I was there when he set a compass upon the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree, and the water should not pass his commandments. You know the waters are still doing that? Now if there's an earthquake, it will change it for a period of time. And other than that, the oceans are still safe. It will come any further than what he told them to. When he appointed the foundation earth, then was I by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his what? Delight. Rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of the earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Now therefore, hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways, hear instruction, and be wise, and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gate, waiting at the post of my doors, for whosoever findeth me, what does he find? Life. Life, and shall obtain what? Favor of the Lord. When you have no fear of the Lord, favors out the window. I promise you, young people, if the adults never listen to you, I want you to listen to me. Follow God. Follow God. When you follow God, favor will follow you. I was I was thinking today, uh, early this morning. We're in such a uh, everything's okay generation. But people who have sex before marriage, one of them will have sex after marriage with somebody else. I've watched it time in and time out. It's always proven to work that way. You know what? And I've watched this very same thing. Sometimes they'll get a big bonus, they'll get a raise, a big raise, and somehow or another it's like they got a hole in the pocket because the favor of the Lord is not there. It gets away from them. I remember Lou Lively told me one time, he said, you know, Mike, he said, uh, I've watched this, and he's been in ministry since back in the 40s. He said, people who never pay tithes will pay their tithes to the mechanic, to the doctor. That 10% will never stay in the pocket. He said, it'll, get, it'll go out somewhere. It'll go somewhere. And you'll never enjoy that 10%. So what are you doing to the Lord? And enjoy the favor of the Lord. If you become generous in that, you'll be to be generous in other things. Amen. Amen. If you're generous, because money is what, what we live by. Right? I don't say much about it. I don't get up here and raise offerings and and uh, say who will give a hundred, who will give fifty, and all that stuff. I don't believe in that stuff. I expect you to hear from the Lord. I expect you to pray about it. There's times that we'll go to a meeting on the way down to down to uh, Johnson or Bella uh, Vista this week. Then uh, mention me some what you want to give in the offer. And uh, here's my feelings. And I've been praying about it. And I said, well, I hadn't thought about that aspect, but that's fine. Uh, I like that. And sometimes we'll go places and just say, what do you want to do? We, we, wherever we go, we try to always give. She'll say, uh, what are we going to do in the offering? And I said, honey, you got the checkbook, and you know what we pay for our bills are. And I'm trusting you to have wisdom in what to give. And after the service, she'll tell me, and I said, well, that's the figure I have. And I didn't want to say it because she knew what was coming to do. You know, but it's so fun to be on the same page spiritually. It's so much fun to be on the same page, and money's not everything, but it's a part of our lives. And, and you know, how many have ever heard somebody say, uh, "Well, that preacher, all he wants is money. 
You ever heard that saying? Well, think about it. Ain't that all you want? Have you ever rented uh, Camp Arena? Those preachers do that. That takes a lot of money. I remember when I was traveling with Brother Tipton, we just run into little old theater building. Some of them cost thousand dollars a night. I'd hate to even imagine what Kip Arena cost. And they charge them by the service, not by the day. You know what? Well, Goldman, he's retired, but he's refired, and he's done some rest of it. But you know, he's got kids at home. I guarantee you, Goldman don't go to work and say, I've got <laughs> I've got these kids at home and they all like bubblegum. This week, and my check just packed bubblegum. <laughs> I just got something down real where you can understand it. I guarantee you, if they brought out this big old toe sack of bubblegum, he could say, take that back where you got it. I want a check. That's what I work for. So when people come up with all that preacher wants money, you remember that's all you want too. <laughs> don't throw that at this preacher. That just irritates me. Even if I don't even care for the preacher, I don't like them to say that. Because they don't know the expense behind that. I've been there. And it's it's uh, it's tremendous. And they're touching more lives in one service than I'll touch in two or three years. Amen. You get, you get a crowd of 20,000 people and only one person got healed with cancer. Wasn't it worth it? Yes. Yes. It would have been if it was my mom or my wife or my sister. Yes. Or myself. Yes. So counter that. When those people, all those preachers want is money. So that's all you want too. It's what you're working for. You're not going to settle for bubble gum. You're not going to settle for groceries. Although you don't take some of that and buy some groceries. But I want a check. Pollock. <laughs> I want a check. You're as much interested in money as anybody else. Because you have expenses. So help me out when those people say that. Go to their defense. And just say, you want money too. That's all you're out there. Right? That's what he said. Go back there. Revelation 1, we go more verse, we'll go. Well, I'm going to work. It says here, uh, in verse 18, Jesus is speaking to John, but it's an allegory of what God is also saying about us. <coughs> he says, <coughs> I am he that liveth and was dead. Couldn't we say that about us? I'm he that liveth and was dead. Now Jesus talked about his physical death. But we were dead to the things of God till we come to an awakening, right? Alright? He says, I mean that living, uh, liveth and was dead, and behold, I live forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of what? Hell and of death. Go to Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 16. <coughs> Seven, 16. <coughs> Seven, 16. All right. Always verse 14. For it's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, which, which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood, and yet it is yet far more evident. That after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest, who is made not after the law of carnal commandments, but after the power of a what? Endless life. Jesus told Martha and Mary, when Lazarus was dead, they said, he said, your brother will live again. And they said, we know, Lord, after the, and the last resurrection. And he said this to them. <coughs> you may get he said, I am the resurrection and the what? Life. I am the resurrection. He said, he that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Then he said, believeth thou this? 
you would say, can you believe that? So, it's not some event coming down the pike in a few years. Resurrection is, the, is a person now. He lives in you. So, Jesus is really saying this about the God-man being us. Because mm -hmm. Willie, was, you got to just know Willie. You got to have him been around him. He goes, come on, help me out. He said, you know, dogs beget dogs and cats beget cats and cows beget cows. Gods beget God. But we run backwards at that. You know, because we immediately look at our downfalls and our mistakes and all that and we say, it couldn't be. Why don't we start looking at it not to, to be bragging about it, but within ourselves. If you understand who you really are, you'll act like it. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> We've preached holiness for years, trying to get people to live up to some standard of dressing and that kind of thing, and that didn't hurt none of us. I didn't like it, but, you know, it mostly applied to the women. Amen. All those guys that preach and preach and, you know, women should have long hair and all done up on their head and, and long dresses and stuff, they all had pretty peace suits on them. <laughs> Alligator shoes snapping about them, you know, they, they had the latest style, but the one lady said, Sometimes they run off with somebody. See, they always want their wife to look like their grandma, but said they run off with somebody that didn't look like their grandma. <laughs> <laughs> so that's true in a lot of cases, but not all people did that. I mean that Lemons was dead and lived life everywhere, amen, and had the keys of hell and of death. <coughs> Last thing in closing, I want to say, Jesus said this, Whosoever sins you retain. What happens? They retain. And whosoever sins you remit, they remit. Not upon no man, not that Lord, I don't have the power to forgive sin, no one you do. He said, No, but when you when you start condemning constantly, they stay condemned, and they never get out of that dilemma. But when you love them unconditionally, not to say, I love their sin, I don't say, I'm okay in what they do, but I'm going to love that person unconditionally, it leaves the Holy Ghost free to work. And their sins are up. They begin to say, God, God, you took care of my sin. And I just thank you for it. Hallelujah. Now understand this God man in the earth is you. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. You should be Jesus manifested in the flesh. Amen? Let's stand. We're going to get into some more allegories later in the book of Revelation. It's just got so many stories in there. <coughs> Hopefully we'll begin to look at this book a little differently and we won't see boats coming out of the ocean like big as Volkswagens and bombs are bursting and the world coming to an end and what are we going to do next? Got our galluses to go straight up, I guess. You know, let, let's understand. God has a plan. He's been working this plan all, all this time. All the way through the Old Testament, the beginning of the New Testament, He's working this plan. We ought to understand, and the day we live in is just beginning to be the best time ever to live in the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, no matter what your situation is, understand God's working with you. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for the power of God that's at work in all of us. Help us, Lord, to see us as you see us. Help us to see others as you see them. And when we see others as you see them, it will take all the condemnation out of our lives and out of our thinking processes. Thank you, Lord, that our our minds will be pure. We will receive. We will understand the right hand ministry. Just as, as you said Jesus was on the right hand of the Father. I always thought, Lord, that that was a big chair in heaven. Lord, I'm learning. I'm learning, Lord, that the right is the receiver. 
And I thank you, Lord, through Jesus Christ, you receive this. Hallelujah. It's starting to become more clear to us uh, what the right hand stands for, what it signifies, and what it means. I just thank you, Lord, for this God-man that you're raising up. That there's, it's wiping out jealousy. It's wiping out things that we would say to one another that's not appropriate. It's wiping out things, Lord, that's in our heart or mind against somebody or family members or whatever. It's wiping that slate clean. So everything that we say and do magnifies God. Hallelujah. Father, go with us as we go to our homes, our jobs, or whatever today. We thank you, Lord, for safety. Thank you, Lord, for blessings of life that you add to us daily. And help us, Lord, to always be a grateful people in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Shake hands with me, friends, and God bless you.